right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, to you our first speaker, which is Dr. Orozco. Um, her interesting fact is that she loves to garden, and with the weather being nice now, it's just uh, really fantastic that the winter is over, and uh, she loves to compost a lot of things. So I'll be interested to learn more about that as well. But today she's going to talk not about gardening, but about glaucoma. And the title of her talk is Exfoliation Syndrome and Glaucoma, the UPEX Study Identifying Systemic Comorbidities. Like, what's a fun fact? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So some of you have probably have seen me present on this um, already. And you're probably like, okay, so does this affect me? So everybody in the room should be familiar with exfoliation because you're going to see it. And how you direct those patients is really going to have um, critical implications for them, also from a systemic perspective. And you can really make a difference in these patients' lives. So this is a culmination of 10, probably 12 years of work now. And um, it, first, it first started when I was actually first got here and I was helping Jean Tabin in triage. And this individual came in, Dr. Karen Curtin, because she was having flashing lights and floaters. And we started talking and she was actually helping Greg Hagerman with the UPDB, looking at AMD patients and looking at um, associations in Epic. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I wonder if that we could do that with glaucoma. So I went to Greg and I asked Greg and I said, okay, what about using the UPDB for glaucoma? And he said, well, Barb, you know, if you talk about glaucoma, it's, and you look at charts and you look at CPTs, you know, it's so subjective, right? You ask 10 glaucoma people if this is glaucoma and you're going to get 10 different answers. So he said, pick a phenotype that actually is documented that if it's in the chart, you can believe it. So we may have false negatives. We may not see exfoliation in the eye and we may miss it, but if we see it and we put it in the chart, then it's probably a pretty good chance that that patient has exfoliation. So why Utah? So this is a little bit of the agenda, exfoliative background. I'm gonna talk about the systemic comorbidities. And we have Aisha here, who has been working on this project with me um, for several years now. And you're gonna see a lot of names. And these are all medical students that have been working on this project for 10 years. And the grant has now finished, it's now culminated. And this is why this project is wrapping up after all these years. So I'm gonna start with a patient. And this is a 72 year old female that presented in 2019 with sudden onset of diplopia. She was 20, 20 um, in both eyes. She had a mild refraction, which was symmetric. And her pressures were 18 and 21, 21 in the left eye. And I want you to remember those numbers. So it's a difference of two. So you may not make much of that, but again, 18 and 21, and she's got plus two exfoliation in her left eye. Fundus was normal. She was triaged to neuro off, got excellent care, was found to have a sixth nerve palsy. And remember that date too, 2019. So about five years ago. So why Utah? So these are some pictures of my daughters years ago now. The little one is almost in college. But Utah is really cool because it's high. We have a high altitude. And we also have a lot of UV light, and that's really relevant for exfoliation. Why? And I'm going to tell you about that. And it's also beautiful here. So what does Utah provide? Well, the University of Utah and the um, Intermountain are all part of something called the UPTB. And we've got an amazing, unique ge uh, genetic resource here. We've got large families, high quality data, and a lot of records. And this was actually where BRCA gene was, was found. Um, we've got Myriad. You know, we've got these genetic studies looking at genetic disorders. And exfoliation is supposed to be genetic, right? Well, what is the UPDB? So Karen actually is on vacation this week and couldn't present this, but we've usually done a tag team. But through Utah genealogies, we can have pedigrees that are... 10 level families deep. So it's, you know, great, 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 great relatives. We've got death certificates, fetal deaths, birth certificates, ambulatory surgeries, inpatient hospital claims, 
driver's license, cancer registry, and now we even have geocodes. So we can see where a patient is living and what altitude they've been living at. And again, interpret how much UV exposure they've had. All in all, we've got over 62 million records accessible to tap into. So that's pretty cool. We know it's a systemic disease. A lot of this work was originally done um, by Ursula Schleitzer in Germany, where she did autopsies on patients with exfoliation and she found material throughout the body. It's been linked or associated with LOXL1 risk allele, which ties into extracellular matrix. And the risk, risk allele is actually reversed in um, Japanese or the Japanese um, individuals. There's also been other genes that have been associated. And this work actually came from Tin, Tin Ong in Singapore, and we were part of this study. So he looked at thousands of bloods, hundreds of thousands of bloods of exfoliation patients from literally around the world. And he found other genes that are actually associated with exfoliation. We have one family here um, that's been just a, a dear family to me in this research. There's five family members. Uh, one had passed away. We have their genealogy and Carter uh, Butterworth is their last name. They've been published in the focus and they actually do not have LOXL1. They've got severe exfoliation and macular degeneration and they do not have LOXL1. So there's definitely other genes that are tied into this. What's going on? How many people think that it's, or believe that it's a genetic disorder? Hands? So this is actually really interesting. The way this research has been going, um, Lou Pasquale believes that it's not a genetic disease. In fact, he thinks the risk allele is just a confounding variable. And a lot of people are now believing that yes, elastin is important, but there's something else going on and it's epigenetics. So there's ultraviolet light, coffee altitude that's been associated with this. And something's going on with the elastin uh, production and degradation. And perhaps there's a traumatic influence, which again is going to be why we've looked at certain disorders. So beyond the eyes, I mentioned Ursula, um, Ursula did a lot of work and she found exfoliative material in brain, heart, lung, kidney and uterus. And I highlight the heart, lung and uterus because again, that's relevant to what we looked at. Um, vascular diseases, um, aneurysms, MIs have also been associated as well as hearing loss. And aneurysms is questionable. Actually, Aisha did a lot of work and has two publications on this because in our database, we found that aneurysms were not associated. And it probably has to do with how the data was captured and reported in the past. Right. If you're looking at charts and you're relying on CBT codes, really were those aneurysms present? The other thing that's really fascinating, and I'll get back to this in our patients, is that despite being a systemic disorder, when people ask the question, do they die earlier? Do patients with exfoliation actually die earlier? They found that they don't. And these were two large papers that actually came out of um, Sweden and Finland. But they never asked the question, do the patients live longer? They just wanted to know if they died earlier. What was the morbidity? So again, remember that interesting fact. So what's LOXL1? A lot of focus has been put on LOXL1 because of the work that came out of um, the Scandinavian and Finland in Helsinki linking LOXL1 as a risk factor. So LOXL1 is an enzyme that converts tropoelastin to elastin. And elastin is critical again for extracellular matrix, ligaments, tissue, lung tissue, uterus tissue, right? So, and even in the eye, elastin is in the eye. So could we use the UPDB to help determine possible systemic associations? So again, over 10 years of work, we looked at the UPDP system and we found that there were 257,000 patients in our healthcare system who had had dilated eye exams. And 
3,000, over 3,000 of those actually had exfoliation syndrome and or glaucoma. So there was some mention of exfoliation in the chart. We used ICD-9 and ICD-10s. And then we did a review of the chart and we found that yes, if the CPT code mentioned exfoliation, there was greater than a 95% chance that there actually was exfoliation in the chart. And then we actually did um, a thorough review based on age. So if patients were 40, 35, we pulled those charts and we actually found it wasn't exfoliation. It was pigment and it was just miscoded. We found the average age was 74, mostly females. And this was consistent with other studies. So we felt pretty good with this data. And then we started to focus on the elastin disorders. Pelvic organ prolapse, that was the first paper that we did. And pelvic organ prolapse, we found, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, um, but there was a clear association. And a lot of the early preclinical data on POP, it's interesting, POP um, is associated with LOXA1, and it also is, um, in it, there's an inheritance pattern, but they don't know what the genetics are. We also looked at AFib, again, because of what Ursula found with exfoliative material in the heart. They also share LOXA1, TGF-beta-1. TGF-beta-1 is elevated in the aqueous of patients with exfoliation. Regular glaucoma, it's TGF-beta-2. Why there's a difference, we don't know. And then emphysematous lung disease. If you take mice and you knock out LOXA-1, these mice are born with um, emphysematous lungs. And then COPD, again, because the elastin fibrin, hernias, uh, again, you know, loose tissue, elastin, and then aneurysms. So the as systemic associations, we looked at age, sex, race, uh, race um, BMI, place of residence, UV exposure, comorbidities. And again, a lot of these um, names you're going to see um, Aisha Chase was involved in a lot of these papers, and we found that pelvic organ prolapse was associated, indirect inguinal hernias, COPD, sleep apnea, AFib, and then aortic aneurysms, as I mentioned, we found were not associated. There was not a clear association between aortic aneurysms in our patient population. So pelvic organ prolapse. Let me go back to pelvic organ. So what was really interesting about pelvic organ prolapse as we started to think about it was, well, what's going on here? And we found that patients who had um, increased vaginal births actually had a higher risk of pelvic organ prolapse, which would make sense. But if they had pelvic organ prolapse, they also had a higher likelihood of going on to develop exfoliation later in life. So again, this trauma to the body, the body's trying to repair itself, the elastin's trying to repair itself, and it can't. And is that why the elastic tissue is dysfunctional and perhaps tying into pelvic organ prolapse? Why COPD? Well, kind of the same thing, right? Elastic tissue. So COPD has increased and altered elastin repair. There's extracellular matrix deposition and also accelerated degradation. And as I mentioned with the LOXL1 mice, those mice had significant emphysematous disease. Now remember too, we're not talking about LOXL1 knockouts. We're not talking about humans not having LOXL1, but there's something about that LOXL1 gene or that enzyme being abnormal in exfoliation patients. We also know that TGF-beta-1, as I mentioned, was tied in with COPD. And there's other um, clusterin and fibula and other related proteins. So we found that exfoliation was in fact associated with a 24% increased risk in COPD. And if you had COPD in exfoliations, you were likely also to be a smoker, which is not a big surprise, right? Smoking gives you COPD. But smoking in a patient with exfoliation had an even higher likelihood of having COPD. So again, was there something about that risk? Was that trauma? Is that trauma the smoke inhalation um, that's causing damage? So is that the traumatic insult? in these patients. But what was really cool is we asked the question, 
do our COP pa COPD patients with exfoliation live longer? And in fact, they do. Not a huge difference, but if you have exfoliation and you have COPD versus having COPD alone and not exfoliation, you will actually live longer. And we found this data as well in AFib patients. So again, AFib has a higher morbidity and mortality, but if you have AFib and exfoliation versus AFib alone, exfoliation seems to be protective. And this was something that uh, Rand Allingham worked with me through the years on this, and he was fascinated by the fact. Was there something that was unique about these patients from a genetic predisposition or perspective? So the last piece is the Bright Focus Grant, and this is the part that's sort of wrapping up. So we did all this pilot work, and then we went to Bright Focus, and we said, okay, we don't understand why some patients go on to develop glaucoma, when they go on to develop glaucoma, and why one eye seems to have glaucoma, and perhaps the other eye only has exfoliation. So we looked to set up criteria, and we tried to figure out the risk for going from exfoliative syndrome to exfoliation glaucoma. We were looking at ocular, non-ocular risk factors, and then we we're gonna validate this with the, in the source data set. So we took our 3,416 patients, we made sure they all had eye exams, dilated eye exams, and then we also did a chart review, and we essentially came up with just under 500 patients that were confirmed. And we found that the majority of these patients actually did convert under three years. So what were the risk factors? What did we find? Well, we found that both eyes actually progressed the majority of cases, and they progressed anywhere between three to five years. So again, when you're seeing an exfoliation syndrome patient, even if they don't seem to have glaucoma damage, keep that three to five year um, time frame in mind mean age to conversion was four and a half years. We found, interestingly enough, that cataract surgery actually seemed to um, increase the likelihood of conversion, which goes against what we originally thought. We, really, we used to think that if you took the cataract out, you decreased the amount of material that actually went into the eye and lowered the likelihood, but it may be that cataract surgery is that trauma. You know, it's oxidative stress. Anytime you operate on any part of the body, you create inflammation, you create oxygen exposure, reactive oxygen species. And perhaps that's the reason why in a uh, compromised eye with a trabecular meshwork that you're getting an increased likelihood of glaucoma. And to the point where now I actually think twice about offering surgery more rapidly to a patient, especially a monocular patient with bad exfoliation in one eye where they've gone blind, I'll be more conservative in the other eye. Ocular hypertension prior to diagnosis, no surprise. If you have exfoliation syndrome and high pressure, likely you're gonna have glaucoma. And then the other thing that was really interesting was statin use. So if you were on statins and you had exfoliation syndrome, you had a higher likelihood of converting. Why? Statins probably are not causative. They're probably just an associated variable. Because why is someone on a statin? Because they've got cardiovascular disease. And that ties into the other thing that we found associated, which was wet AMD. So patients with wet AMD and exfoliation actually have a higher likelihood of progressing with both diseases. So if you've got a patient with wet AMD and they've got exfoliation, chances are they're gonna go on to glaucoma more rapidly and vice versa. So the statin is just a marker. It's just a biomarker, right, for more cardiovascular disease. So we're currently um, in the process of writing this up. And again, if you have wet AMD, you actually have a two-time higher likelihood of going on to glaucoma. Um, and we found that it was more significant if the wet AMD presented first. Why? I don't know. Um, but that was what we noticed. And this was also... Um, has already been reported in a smaller study in Greece. So really we're confirming that. So again, these eyes are sick. You know, there's, there's inflammation, there's ischemia, there's underlying um, abnormalities from a vascular perspective, and they just need to be followed very closely for both. 
so what does this really mean from a clinical perspective? Well, if you have a patient with exfoliation syndrome and or exfoliation glaucoma, ask them about hernias. If they're a smoker, ask them about COPD or get them to a pulmonologist. Ask them about pelvic organ prolapse, rectal prolapse. The other thing we found too, and this is tied into UV exposure and altitude, is that we also found that these patients in our cohort had a higher likelihood of non-melanotic skin cancer. And why is that important? Well, that actually has been reported by Janie Wiggs and Lou Pasquale in um, the Nurses Health um, data set. And we corroborated that. And that's pretty cool because we think about melanomas as being UV related, but it's actually the basal and the squamous cell. And ultraviolet light, again, is a traumatic injury to tissue. So what is ultraviolet light doing to the skin? Well, it's damaging a lot, it's damaging elastin, right? It's damaging elastic tissue and the body goes to repair itself. And again, perhaps in patients with underlying exfoliation risks, they can't repair that elastic tissue correctly. And maybe that's why they're more susceptible. And again, it's relevant for your patients, you know, get them to a dermatologist, get them to a cardiologist. They're going to have a higher likelihood of, um, of AFib and then the pulmonologist. And if they have exfoliation syndrome and cataracts, maybe, you know, again, caution them, watch them closely. If you're going to operate, you know, consider doing some sort of GAT or angle-based surgery at the same time, because you know that they are going to more likely go on to glaucoma. And then, as I mentioned before, um, you know, to the retina colleagues, if they have wet AMD, they just need to be really followed closely again for that conversion to glaucoma. So back to our patient. So she got lost to follow up and she recently showed up in my clinic in Redstone and she came in to see uh, Ryan Coyle because she felt that her left eye was getting worse and that she needed a new pair of glasses. So she's now 77 and she presents with 20, 30 vision in 2060 and her pressures are now 22 and 48. So she still only has exfoliation in her left eye. There's nothing that I can see on right eye. Um, and she's got more of a significant cataract in her left eye. And this is her, her OCT. I tried to do a visual field. Literally, this is two days, uh, two weeks ago that she came in. So it's pretty, pretty recent. And I just thought, wow, this is really relevant for this conversation. It's been five years. She's now got advanced glaucoma in that eye. And she's got no symptoms except for decreased vision, no pain because there's a slow, you know, a slow rise to pressure, increased cup to disc. I put her on COSOPT and a beta um, a prostaglandin, not really expecting much, but just trying to tie her over because she's clearly distraught, upset, doesn't understand. This is a lot to take in and, you know, kind of mentally prepping her for, we need to get the pressure down. Chances are this is not really going to work you're going to need surgery. So she comes in um, four weeks later, and she's now 24 and 26. So the left eye came down a little bit, right? Or did it? So this is her on her cosopt and prostaglandin. Her right eye is going up to 31 from an, um, a low of 18, and her left eye is going as high as 40. So even on topical medications, she's clearly not controlled. And I'm glad I didn't give her the home tonometry prior to putting her on the COSOPT and the prostaglandin because she's probably going up into the 60s. Um, but she clearly has got, you know, glaucoma in both eyes at this point. She's probably, you know, we're catching it early in the right, but she's going to need um, something done in the left. And she's going to need surgery, probably in both eyes. And then the other thing just to note is that she's spiking early in the morning, which is what we uh, classically and traditionally now are seeing in glaucoma patients as well as exfoliation, and they tend to spike higher in exfoliation. So the key takeaways, even if it's an asymmetric normal IOP, if there's exfoliation, it's a red flag. You know, think about following that patient more closely, have them come back first thing in the morning, um, definitely needs to be followed at least every six months, if not sooner. 
And then they can also, you know, convert rapidly to glaucoma. So that's another key thing. They can progress rapidly. They can go on to have um, vascular events in the back of the eye, probably because they're having these horrible spikes. They're more likely to have um, central retinal vein occlusions, ischemic optic neuropathies. And as I mentioned, they don't have pain. So a lot of times they come in presenting just by noticing a change in their vision. And then obviously the visual field loss, you know, can go into fixation very quickly. So this is all the support and the funding. As I mentioned, it's been a huge undertaking for 10 years worth of work and it's been fun. Um, it's led to a lot of publications and a lot of uh, up and coming ophthalmology uh, CVs. And um, it's been really enjoyable. And of course we can't do this without the patients. And I could not have done this without Karen. Karen was amazing, both as a epidemiologist, statistician and in internal medicine and just the UPDB guru. And then again, it was um, a consorted effort with others literally around the world. That's it. Any questions? Yes, Bob. What, what's the youngest age you've personally seen changes of pseudo exfoliation? Probably in the 50s. Um, Bob Rich always talks about and presents um, a case from years ago that was a teenager that had undergone, um, you know, basically had suffered like a traumatic cataract and ended up with a PK. So it had undergone several um, different surgical procedures. And he always thought that that was the contributing risk factor, but that's sort of a one-off. Wondering if we should be looking for something that would relate to this in our pediatric patients. You know, it's, it's interesting because when I first started the work, even from the genetic perspective, and we brought in the pedigrees in the families, right? So we brought in the kids and we were calling them healthy, unaffected. But do we know that? How do we know that that 30 year old isn't going to go on to develop exfoliation in 30 years? And you're absolutely right. We just don't know. All these patients you're seeing were all kids once. Yes. Yep. Questions. What did we miss? Not picking up something we needed to find out. And I think it gets back to this whole genetic, you know, discussion. I mean, Lou is really to the point where, um, Lou Pasquale, to the point now when we write the papers, I have to be very careful about calling it a genetic disorder because I'll get dinged. Like he is that adamant that this is not genetic. He thinks it's a complete, you know, the basically we have to rewrite the textbooks. Good presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions? I don't know. Okay. Thanks, Lydia. I don't think we have any microphones today. So thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it's uh, We have another speaker. Uh, his name is Dominic Capaccioli. He is a P2I3 resident in child neurology. And his fun fact is that he grew up sharing a property line with a national park. And he's going to be talking today about ophthalmic considerations in neurofibromatosis type 1. All right. Hello. Um, let me just get this going real quick. Okay, great. Um, thanks. So I'll be going over a, a case of a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1 and then reviewing some of the newer literature on long-term outcome in these patients. Um, so to start, this was a <clears throat> sorry, this was a nine-year-old male who was referred to clinic um, 
due to some blurry vision that he reported to his psychiatrist. He had been seen by uh, ophthalmology in the past in 2016, a referral from his primary care provider uh, due to the presence of cafe au lait macules. He had a normal eval at that time and had been lost to ophthalmology follow-up. In 2022, he did present to genetics, met clinical criteria for NF1, and uh, the geneticist did recommend an MRI brain for him at that time due to concern uh, for pre precocious puberty due to a large growth spurt he had um, recently gone through. Uh, but he being he was in the foster care system, um, changed foster care homes, and was last to follow up, so he never had any imaging done. <clears throat> when he presented to clinic, he noted that he was having some intermittent blurry vision in his eyes and that um, he said his eyes would burn when he was at school or sometimes when he was looking at a computer for too long, said it was hard for him to see. Um, his history is relevant uh, for uh, positive for astigmatism. He has autism spectrum disorder as well as a slew of uh, psychiatric comor uh, disorders. And then uh, his current foster mom noted that he seems to be getting clumsier and had been complaining of a headache slightly more frequently than he had in the past. Medically, otherwise, he had been fairly healthy. He was born at 34 weeks premature. He was um, the surviving twin uh, twin twin transfusion syndrome. As far as his family history is concerned, not a whole lot is known. Um, his mom is still somewhat in the picture. It's known she has NF1 as well. Um, no one else in the family with known diagnosis there. And then a lot of psychiatric comorbidity in the family. On, <clears throat> on exam, he was noted to have slightly diminished visual acuity. He had normal pressures, normal pupillary exam, visual fields color. Um, his stereo was slightly diminished. He was an orthophoric, uh, normal slit lap exam. And then he did have two plus disc pallor bilaterally on his dilated fundoscopic exam. So um, here is his OCT. And you can see pretty clearly the um, atrophy more so on the um, left eye or on the left nerve compared to the right. He then did go ahead and get his MRI brain and you can see pretty uh, evidently here um, that uh, the, the OPG present on his optic nerve in the chiasm. Um, otherwise in his brain, he did have a focal area of signal intensity in the thalamus there on the, um, <clears throat> on, on the right side, um, which is still not really having a whole lot of clinical significance placed in these um, other than lesions in the, in the thalamus can be associated with mild cognitive impairment. And so overall, this was a child who presented um, for blurry vision with neurofibromatosis type one, found to have bilateral optic nerve atrophy, uh, concerning for an optic pathway glioma at the chiasm, uh, initially presenting later on, but with a first symptom of precocious puberty starting around age four. Um, he did receive urgent referrals to neuro-oncology, neuro neurosurgery, and endocrinology. Um, neurosurgery does not plan to intervene. He is planning to start on uh, solumetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor um, for targeted therapy. And then we are still awaiting um, endocrine evaluation. He has repeat ophthalmology scheduled for May. Um, just to briefly review optic pathway gliomas, about 15% of patients with NF1 go on to develop um, these low-grade tumors, um, about 50% of them will be symptomatic with loss of acuity, decreased visual fields, and sometimes even more obscure uh, symptoms such as behavior changes or agitation um, in younger children who can't necessarily report those symptoms more clearly. Uh, on exam, you may find proptosis, strabismus, uh, nerve pallor, disc fullness. Onset is usually before the age of 10. Um, and then if the tumor does sit there and proliferate, you can uh, have impingement of the optic nerve and interfere with the HPA, causing precocious puberty, as was the case in this child. As far as genetics are concerned, there is um, consideration that mutations in the NF1 gene, uh, codons 844 to 848, are more likely associated with these tumors, as about 50% of children with mutations in that region uh, did go on to develop an OPG. And then treatment is somewhat shifting. Uh, Historically, it was there was a lot of radiation therapy, then it moved more towards chemotherapy with carboplatin and vincristine. And more recently, there's been a shift to the more targeted therapies such as uh, the MEK inhibitors uh, for more um, specific um, therapy and less systemic effect. To review uh, NF1 versus sporadic OPGs, those with NF1 tend to have um, 
tend to be a slightly older presentation, have um, tumors in more variable locations, and are more likely to present without an initial visual concern or complaint. The sporadic tumors tend to be younger onset, more commonly in the chiasmatic region, um, and often presenting with visual acuity loss or atrophy or edema of the optic nerve. They can also present with signs of increased intracranial pressure, and they are associated with a worse prognosis. So um, looking at some more recent outcome studies for these tumors, there was this, uh, review, uh, this study from 2021 looking specifically at NF1 patients with uh, OPGs uh, who had been followed for 10 years or more. They reviewed about 45 patients looking more specifically at acuity in eye patient in optic nerve head pallor. Most of these patients they reported were asymptomatic at presentation about eight, on nearly 80% of them. And this study did conclude that the initial optic nerve appearance was the strongest predictor of the appearance at the end of the follow-up, um, which is somewhat reassuring. And their last contact data, where they were looking at these patients at their most recent appointment, um, most of them had either mild or no visual impairments, 65% um, of them with mild to no impairment in either eye, um, about 60% with at least one pill optic nerve, 30% had other sort of other sign of tumor, and then about 40% of them did need treatment. Treatment was typically started within about 10 months or so after diagnosis. Interestingly, they noted that um, patients who, <clears throat> who initially had a normal eye exam, uh, which was about half, of the, um, about half of the patients here in the study, only one of them en ended up developing moderate or uh, severe visual impairment uh, 10 plus years down the line. And similarly, those patients who are diagnosed with OPG um, in the second five years of life being ages five to 10, all had normal vision at follow-up. And this is just a brief, this is one of their uh, analysis tables and highlighting at the bottom is the more significant correlations with the initial visual acuities um, associating with the outcomes of vision um, abnormalities um, later on. This here's a study that has um, just been accepted for publication that I came across. Um, looking, it's a French cohort looking at um, very long term outcome. They reviewed patients about 180 um, diagnosed and uh, followed between the 80s and now, um, with a mean length of follow up of 17 years. Um, an interesting <clears throat> caveat for this cohort is they did have a high uh, percentage of the patients receiving some form of radiotherapy. I think a lot of that just is um, change in times in terms of or therapeutic management of these tumors. And this <clears throat> study also noted that um, there was a higher risk of secondary event, regardless of the um, etiology with the younger age of diagnosis. So for the patients diagnosed between one and five years, the, odds ratio, the hazard ratio was about 1.7 um, compared to those diagnosed at five years or later. Um, the, opto, uh, the ophthalmologic sequelae noted, um, they, with the inclusion of patients of sporadic and NF1 type um, tumors, they did have a larger percentage of patients with initial um, symptoms present. And then at last contact, they did seem to have some progression of these visual concerns, about 80% of the patients, uh, over half of them with decreased visual acuity, um, some with visual field loss and some with blindness. This study, <clears throat> sorry, um, also looked at the um, overall survival in these patients beyond the 10 year um, or beyond the five year mark. So I, I wanna highlight here that this data is looking at patients who survived beyond five years. So take that with a grain of salt as this, um, as the, obviously the morbidity and mortality of sporadic NPG, uh, OPGs within the first five years is significantly higher. Um, but, in those patients who did make it beyond those first five years and were included in the study, the survival rate was about the same. In the NF1 and sporadic uh, cases, about 18% of the NF1 patients died of some form of some etiology and about 19% uh, of the sporadic cases died. As you can see, the distribution of cause, attributed cause of death is pretty similar between the groups, whether it was OPG progression uh, a second malignant neoplasm developing or a, another etiology. And most of these deaths, especially in the NF1 population were beyond 10 years of the initial diagnosis. So in this graph here on the, um, on the right, you see the, the upper black line is overall survival. 
and uh, looking out about 15 years, you do see pretty good survival rate, but then it continues to steadily decline. Whereas if you're looking at the late event free survival curve, which is the lighter gray curve, you see that within 10 to 15 years, about half of the patients, regardless of NF1 or sporadic, go on to develop some form of secondary complication or visual acuity loss or something of that nature from these tumors. Um, as far as other cons uh, other factors they looked at are concerned, they did also find that um, there were some end endocrine differences between the two groups. Uh, NF1 seemed to have a lower risk of corticotropin or thyroid or gonadotropin insufficiency compared to the sporadic tumors, which they attribute likely to the, the frequency of distribution of the tumors between the two populations. And then NF1 was also was associated with a slightly higher risk of precocious puberty. Um, as you can see with the confidence, confidence interval, it's pretty, pretty close. Um, but I think that is interesting to note is this patient did present with precocious puberty that um, in this case here. Um, briefly to touch on their radiation therapy, um, they noted that it was much more common in the earlier patients, those treated before 2000, 33 of the 35 patients had some form of radiotherapy compared to those um, in the more recent uh, years, um, 2015 and beyond, only five of the 38 were treated for with radiation therapy, and those were second-line tumors. Um, sorry, second-line for relapse of tumors. And here's a brief breakdown um, of that, as you can see, of the people who went on to develop the second malignant neoplasm, which was the major concern with the radi radiation therapy. Um, it was pretty um, common in both groups. Uh, overall, the NF, about six NF1 patients had a second malignant neoplasm. Four of those patients were exposed to radiation therapy. In the sporadic group, four of the five were exposed to radiation therapy, and you can see there that um, both in living and deceased patients in both group, uh, there was a pretty even distribution of radiation exposure there, although there is certainly um, the, the question of if they're going on to treat with radiation therapy, is it because they're having worse or more progressive disease? Um, and so maybe a little bit difficult to um, parse apart the exact causative effects in this situation. Um, overall, I think these two studies are pretty important. We have one study from 2021 uh, focusing specifically on the NF1 patients that shows overall pretty reassuring data um, and progression of the tumors as uh, is sort of along the expectations um, historically for the differences in etiology of the OPG tumors. And we have another study looking at even longer outterm, longer outcome effects. Um, as far as I could find a review, and as far as they, the authors noted, um, they believe that to be the longest outterm study uh, outcome study for patients with optic pathway gliomas. Um, but I think both studies go along to suggest that earlier diagnosis is associated with higher risk of complications. Um, tumor location is very important in terms of uh, presentation of the initial clinical signs and symptoms, and as well as survival outcomes. And although uh, optic pathway gliomas are less aggressive initially in NF1 patients, they do still warrant prolonged monitoring, um, especially in those patients diagnosed at early age, as it seems the rate of long-term complications being those complications occurring beyond five years of life uh, post-diagnosis are actually pretty similar to those with OPGs as in that more recent study. Um, and I think this also leads to the question of in patients with NF1 who are asymptomatic, maybe at you know, 10 years of life, how often do they really need to be coming back for routine evaluation if overall, if they're, if they're remaining asymptomatic, if overall um, um, outcome data for these patients is rather reassuring. Obviously, there would be exceptions in a case like this patient here, um, where there are some other risk factors, whether that be um, some mood, psychiatric uh, comorbidities or psychosocial risk factors that may make a patient more prone to missing initial um, symptoms and concerns, that would be a consideration. But in the overall general healthy NF1 patient, maybe something to consider going forward. And oops, and that's, that's what I have. Thanks. Yep. So this is not that I understand. So the reason they're not doing radiation therapy 
it didn't seem to be helpful, but there was also that increased risk of secondary malignancies due to the radiation. I think the biggest reason is the secondary malignancy risk due to the radiation. There was a, um, sorry, I don't know. Dependent mouse that slide. Um, where is it? There. And then I guess the second question is what's the prognosis for this boy? Um, so that's a good question. I, I am un unsure, um, to be frank. I know he is starting on um, therapy. It seems as though his um, tumor, while it is, um, you know, pretty substantial, I think the biggest concern is for him is the visual loss. He has gone through his growth spurt. He's already started puberty. He's had development of um, axillary and pubic hair at this point. So I think a lot of those changes are um, have have happened already, um, especially with the compression of the optic nerve and the atrophy of the nerves. I'm unsure how much of that he'll get back. As far as long-term outcomes for um, survival and things, they didn't really comment on that in the uh, oncology note that I could that I could pick up on. So, um, but ref going back to your first question of the radiation therapy, um, there was this study from 2022 that came out noting the incidence of secondary malignancy from the therapy. Um, and so with more targeted therapies available, like the MEK inhibitors, I think that's the reason that, and honestly, and the chemotherapy, um, that's the reason I think these therapies are taking a, a backseat and reserve for more severe cases. Barbara, in answer to your question, having followed most of the kids seen here for the last almost 40 years, Radiation causes lots of, that's a great presentation, collateral damage from radiation or surgical excision, which was the other issue that was done in sun centers, including ours years ago, um, had huge comorbidity. And so Carol Bruggers, who treated our, our pediatric neuro oncologist who just retired recently, and I followed most of these kids, and she developed a, a program, you know, as, as part of the oncology group uh, to use, use single agent carboplatin treatment. And uh, we're able to halt growth of most tumors. And But the issue wasn't, you're absolutely right. Vision doesn't improve. What you're looking for is absence of further loss of vision without damage to surrounding structures because these things occur in areas where there are lots of things that are near and dear to these kids that we don't want to destroy with radiation. So radiation, was a lot, if it's causing things you just can't, they can't live with, then we did that, but it did horrible things for those kids. And so this is great. The jury, I think, is still out on the mega inhibitors. You know, we've seen actually vision issues. We saw a child have a corneal perforation. I mean, these are most with the eye issues. One issue is the optic pathway gliomas. The other are the plexiform neurofibromas. And the plexiform neurofibromas shrink but as they shrink, sometimes they cause dramatic exposure issues. And in, you know, our N of one with exposure issues, child uh, perforated a corneal ulcer basically due to shrinkage and the lids. And this was in a patient who had had multiple surgeries to deep bulk the plexiform neurofibromas. So a very complicated patient who also has severe glaucoma. And you know, those are, some of these kids are severely affected but this, this is great, and I think you're right. the MEK inhibitors are certainly the treatment of the future in terms of a lot of issues with NF1. And uh, thanks for your interest in this. These kids uh, deserve to be taken care of, and I hope as you go into pediatric neurology, you continue to uh, see them and follow them. That's good. Yeah, it's a great presentation. Yeah, really good.